All right, here we are with Paul Lunaire. Appreciate you taking the time to talk with us today. Um, Always a pleasure, my boy. I wanted to thank you, man. And I wanted to ask you about um, your poetry first, because that's kind of how I, I learned about you or met you initially. Um, how did you find your, your voice for your poetry? You got such a unique approach to it. And um, w when did you get started on it? So uh, when I was a kid, my first passion, I mean, you know, when you're a kid, you you, you kind of want to do everything, right? So when I was, when I was a kid, I, I wanted to be uh, an inventor of machines and robots, uh, and then somehow that became me wanting to be a cartoonist, uh, an animator, because, you know, I would watch a lot of cartoons and animations in the 90s where there were a lot of inventor, mad doctor characters, right? Like, yeah, I want to build shit and take over the world, and then I realized that you have to learn a lot of uh, math and engineering, and I thought that shit was boring. <laughs> so I, I wanted to actually just draw things instead, which is more fun. Um, I didn't really get into poetry until, um, I'd, I'd say maybe when I was 13, because I always played music as a kid, right? I used to take piano classes. Um, I always took, you know, they make you take music in elementary school, you know, you'd play the recorder and all that shit. Uh, I took band in middle school, but... Where'd you play in middle school? Uh, Ponce, Ponce de Leon Middle School. Oh, yeah. But yeah. what instrument? Oh, um, I played the least sexy sounding instrument. Triangle? Yeah. No. <laughs> Tri triangle at least sounds cute, right? There's nothing cute and sexy about the instrument that I played, which was the euphonium. What? Right? So the reason I picked that is because... Um, obviously, the, the band teacher goes around, he asks, what do you want to play? A trumpet, saxophone, all these fucking youngins want to play saxophone, right? The, the idea of the sexy jazz musician. Um, nobody picked the euphonium, so the teacher gets to me, and then he's like, guys, no one has picked this instrument. Is anyone going to take it? And, you know, me being goody two-shoes back then, I, I just go, yeah, fuck it, I'll do it. <laughs> all right? And I lucked out because, so it's basically like a smaller tuba, but the cool thing about it is that in music, I'm sure you know this, um, there are certain instruments where you, when you're reading music, you have to transpose the notes for whatever range your, mus uh, your instrument plays in. Yeah, yeah. I didn't have to do that, right? I, I got super Stand lucky me. because whenever I would read music, that was it. And all these other kids would get tormented because they would have to think, six notes higher or three notes down. And it's like, I'm good, man. <laughs> I, I, I got fucking lucky here. How long did you do that? Like how many seasons or years or whatever? Um, I played band a little bit until high school, oh, yeah. which kind of coincided around when I started uh, writing poetry. Um, I think it was in freshman year. So my dad was always in a rock and roll, right? <clears throat> and um, when I was a kid, he would always, you know, be buying concert DVDs when that was still a thing. Uh, you know, before the advent of YouTube. And, uh, you know, obviously he would be watching guys like Led Zeppelin. Uh, he would watch the hell out of that DVD with the, the desert on the cover. So he would watch the Earl's Court performances and Royal Albert Hall. Um, well, back then, the, the audiences just wanted a little rock and roll. Little rock and roll from these British blokes. Your dad was playing rock and roll at home. and He, he was playing rock and roll at home. Um, my mom strictly forbade me listening to that stuff and <clears throat> uh, meanwhile I was listening to electronic music right because I was a little video game dork um, but he would also listen to guys like Nine Inch Nails you know a guy in his late 30s early 40s listening to that stuff I, I think is pretty cool in hindsight because he was always trying to just listen to new stuff right, right. you know um, Nine Inch Nails had a song called Head, Head Like a Hole uh, I love the electronic rhythm of it. Uh, I love the lyrics about ruling the world and all that because I, I loved villains back then as a kid. That was kind of my gateway. Uh, so I would say the two groups that kind of were my gateway into rock and roll were Nine Inch Nails and a group that just came out with a song called Feel Good Inc. Gorillas, right? So uh, Gorillas uh, were my first favorite group because I like Nine Inch Nails but I didn't like them enough to care about their albums but Gorillaz man I heard Feel Good Inc I told my dad dude you got to get me this album Demon Days right um, 
and yeah they were kind of my gateway and then through them i ended up opening up to uh led zeppelin and pink floyd uh i always liked the beatles because he would always be playing vhs tapes of them uh performing um but the group that really made me think about poetry was the doors right and i'm sure everyone's heard that story but man the thing you know you hear jim morrison's deep voice you hear his lyrics about exploring the the dark side uh and all that and it was through the doors that i got into mythology and psych uh, psycho uh, psychology you know freudian uh, ideas and all that with uh, his famous lyrics about father i want to kill you mother i want to oh baby in the end um and i think it's because of the doors that i also got the deep voice because as a kid i would try to imitate his voice and then my voice just kind of got stuck there <laughs> i guess yeah man so the doors were the gateway for me really exploring poetry as an art form um and it's just been a really fun journey since then because uh you know you, you grow up and you and you think oh man only old music is is where it's at but you slowly open yourself up i opened myself up to punk to, to hip-hop uh, eventually more modern stuff in the past couple of years um iggy pop became a big influence on my poetry as well he was like jim morrison except he was if he was more of a burger eating stooge <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I would say that that's been my, my journey. Uh, the Doors opened it up. Uh, blues music was a big influence. Uh, you know, guys like Howlin' Wolf, um, Bo Diddley. Uh, I really like the Delta Blues stuff in particular because of how dry and twangy it sounded, right? Um, and because of blues, I fell in love with poets like Langston Hughes, um, my mom, for my 16th birthday, gave me a, an anthology of poetry called The Outlaw Book of Poetry, which is also a big influence, right? Um, so I would say that that's kind of the origin story of how I got into that really cool. as an art form. And um, I would say more, more importantly, I liked poetry not, not necessarily for the writing aspect of it, but for the performative mm -hmm. man. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, Jim Jim and Iggy, they would go up and Iggy would Iggy would sing dumb shit, uh, you, you know, with all due respect, but he would sing shit like, um, uh, it's 1969 all across the USA, another year for me and you, another year with nothing to do. But he would really bring those words to life by just acting like an animal, man. So that's what I would try to do when I perform. I just, <laughs> for me, the writing is secondary to the performing hmm. because I feel like you can write a poem that's just five words but you can really bring those five words to life with, with a killer ass performance hmm. man that's true man huh? yeah yeah when did you start performing poetry I know that back you know there was the Churchill <coughs> open mics and stuff is when I first you got on my radar but like what was your like first I guess stab at you know putting it out there for for people like um I I would kind of read my poetry for a creative writing club back in high school. Uh, I went to Coral Gable Senior High. Um, and then I kind of took a hiatus when I moved to Costa Rica. And, you know, it, it was a weird time in Costa Rica, um, but I didn't really go and explore venues. You know, I was just kind of always getting pissed drunk with my friends, working call centers, and that was kind of a, a dark age. For me you know um and then when i moved back to miami in 2017 um i had friends who would all go to churchill's and las rosas and they were all into that scene and a friend of mine one day uh my my first actual performance here in miami um was in 2017 and this guy goes hey man you should come with me to to taurus right they got an open mic so here's what i didn't know right the open mic was for fucking comedy right it was for stand-up comics i go and i sign up and i'm i'm watching everyone perform and then i go huh that's funny I, there, there's no poets there's a whole lot of stand-up comics though did your friend know this going in honestly <laughs> he's the kind of guy that he probably did know and he didn't want to tell me he just kind of lured me out there and just tried to bait me into <laughs> doing my poetry for a rowdy heckling comedy crowd right 
because I feel like crowds that go for a comedy, they're there to get drunk and fuck with people, <laughs> especially at Taurus. So, dude, uh, I go up and I did a poem that I, I haven't performed since. It was it was like um, some poem that I wrote about society and being at the bottom of the food chain. It was really amateur as shit, but I go up there and I do it. And initially, there's a bunch of people that are kind of heckling me. One, because of the voice, right? <laughs> They're like, stop pretending to have a deep voice, man. What's your real voice? And then I just keep going. And then eventually, I wand them over by the end, right? And, and the, the motherfuckers that were heckling me, they are like, yo, man, you got, you got some big balls to go up there and do that, man. That was pretty cool, man. I fucks with you. I fucks with you. That's cool, man. Um, I was pissed at my friend, obviously, for, for baiting me. Sure. But... Uh, yeah, so that was kind of my start, and I would just kind of keep going to these little places. Uh, like there used to be a place called 305 Brews, uh, where they used to also have a small open mic. Um, and then eventually in 2018 is when I re really started to explore uh, Churchill's and Las Rosas. Um, and, you know, from there I just kind of kept honing my craft. And how was the crowd reaction like with the, as you were? You know getting more into it and developing it more it was good man um at the at the beginning uh i would do this poem called satan take the wheel which i did because i knew it would get a reaction out of people man we live in an age where so many things that used to be considered taboo are just the norm right but something about mentioning satan like not even the devil but you mentioned satan and people just get fucking scared man <laughs> because it wasn't a poem about just Ooh, uh, rock and roll and, and the devil. It was about basically being tired of being a good guy and letting Satan make the decisions for you, right? Uh, and I wrote that at a time where I was just kind of feeling frustrated, so it wasn't just something I wrote just to entertain people. But I would do it, and I would do it, you know, screaming at the top of my lungs and dropping to my knees. Uh, and there was a little bit of blues in that too, right? And people would either tell me they didn't like the subject or they would come up to me and they'd go, man, that was great, man. You poured all your soul into it. Um, you know, it, w it wasn't necessarily always um, complete reverence for what I did, but, uh, but people understood that I was giving my body much in the same way as what I told you, that people give their bodies to boxing. You know, to me, boxing and poetry and and the arts and everything is all connected. You know, that's why I, I always come here to this boxing gym, even if I'm 32, I'm not gonna be a pro boxer, but I come here because for me, there's this sort of symbolism in, in giving everything you can to, uh, to what it is you love. Blood, you know? sweat, and tears, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I wasn't happy with these poets that they would just go and they would look at their phone or they would read from their book, you know, no disrespect. Everyone has their own thing, mm -hmm. right? And I learned that over with time, you know, you might have one way of doing things. That doesn't mean that everyone has to do it that way. You know, um, for some people, they just want to go up and read their poems, but that's okay. But I wanted to go up there and just kind of show people poetry can be something else. It can be something fucking raw and rock and roll and entertaining. You know, I was trying to bring it back to Iggy Pop and Jim Morrison, man, you know, uh, people have this idea of poetry as this sleepy thing, or they think of it as uh, slam poetry, you know, I, and no disrespect to slam poetry, but I feel like sometimes people, they can take any poem, and then they can just make it sound really intense by reading every line like this, uh, you know, so I was trying to show that there's a third route mm -hmm. to the way you perform, and people really appreciated that, and uh, I think over time, because I used to take improv theater classes as well. And I learned that, so when I started performing, right, um, it was easy for people to be entertained because I was throwing myself on the floor and yelling a lot, like it was like punk poetry. But I think something I learned in the last few years, especially when you live life as well, is that <clears throat> your poetry can really take on layers when you begin to put peaks and valleys mm -hmm. into what you write you know not everything has to be yelled and angry when you do it almost like a monologue in theater mm -hmm. you know it makes those points where you're just <laughs> you know where you're really yelling it gives it more poignancy and and depth when you 
you know, kind of reel people in. You hit the brakes on the car a little bit. Build it up. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because when I started performing, I was just hitting all cylinders, right? Uh, and I learned that it makes more of an impact on people if you learn how to dial it back. Mm -hmm. Because that's life. That's boxing, too, you know. You, you go into a boxing ring and you just, <laughs> you're going to gas the fuck out, man. You ain't making it past round one. If you, pace yourself. yeah, you got to pace yourself and then boom, then you hit them. Mm -hmm. Everything, True. everything is tied together for me, man. True, man. You've kind of been progressing and, you know, picking up skills and just going at it and, and killing it. Like, can you tell me a little about how you got into the voice acting and yeah. what, what have you worked on? Like, um, I would say that that voice acting is definitely something I always wanted to do since I was a kid too. Um, like I remember when I was in elementary school, <clears throat> uh, SpongeBob just came out, right? And it's so crazy that that show is still going, right? Um, I, I feel old as fuck thinking about <laughs> it, man. I was nine years old when that show wow. came out, and, it, and it's really crazy to tell kids that are like fifteen or fourteen. Yeah, I was. I, I was still a fucking baby when, when this show came out. But yeah, the show would come out. And the thing is that as a kid, I like imitating voices, right? <laughs> so in elementary school, I would imitate entire episodes of this show in the voices for my friends and they, they all loved it. They were like, can, can you do last night's episode, right? Um, I was like doing voices um, and people would always tell me, yeah, you should be a voice actor. And I, I just never really pursued it and that was kind of a recurring uh, theme in a lot of things that I liked, but never really pursued. And that was especially a thing in Costa Rica. People would always tell me, you should do this and this. And I would just go, yeah, yeah. I just don't know how to do it, right? That was bullshit. It's, it's not, if someone tells you, I don't know how to do it, there's also a little bit of, I don't think I can do it. Right. Um, so, it definitely was something that I thought was cool, but I just never really launched myself fully into it for one reason or another. Even when I first moved back to Miami from Costa Rica in 2017, uh, I was working as a package room guy at a condominium in Brickell. And there was a guy there who said, you should go and audition for the kitchen. Uh, yeah, that you would do great. You just sent him an email saying, hey, I want to audition. And looking back on it, I just don't know why I didn't do it because it really is like that. Um, and a lot of times these folks don't even necessarily look for people with experience. I could have absolutely started earlier, but uh, I think in life you just, you kind of come to certain things at the when right time. When yeah, ready, yeah, yeah. When, when you're ready. And yeah. at, at that time, I was still in this thing of, oh, I just moved back to Miami. I just want to fuck around with, around with my friends. Uh, I don't know if I want to do this because then it will take away time for me eating shit. Right. <laughs> but um, so beginning in 2018, up until a couple of years ago, I would go to different improv classes um, with uh, this group called Front Yard Theater Collective. Uh, then I would go to uh, Cold Script Readings, uh, which is where you met me, mm -hmm. uh, of this uh, group called Naked Angels. Mm -hmm. And I would perform my poetry there sometimes. And, and eventually I just told the lady who ran it, hey, give me a fucking script because I want to act. I don't want to just perform poetry, right? Uh, and then she eventually would, and it was great. Um, I thought stage acting was fun, but it's just something that I never really felt a strong attachment to. Um, but one day, um, a fellow actor friend named Adam Crane, um, who, would, who would go to these uh, networking cold script reading sessions, uh, he and I just hit it off. He was a, a funny ass dude. And one day uh, he put out on Instagram that he was looking for people to uh, help him take on a couple of jobs because this dude was just working all the time, right? If he wasn't voice acting or stage acting, he was doing something else like bartending or I, I, I don't know what else. And I saw voice acting on there. This is at, at the end of 2020, I think it was. And I just shot a Hail Mary and I said, I want to voice act. Tell me more about it. And he goes, oh, my God, dude, you would be fucking perfect for it. Okay, uh, here, here's what you got to do. So he recommended to me a bunch of studios uh, to audition for. Um, and he gave me a bunch of very useful tips um, on what the process is like. He stressed 
bring a bottle of water <laughs> because that is what if you bring a bottle of water it's going to make you look professional and it's the fuel that keeps you going right Are yeah you- yeah the first few times that i voice acted i didn't think i needed a bottle of water and then uh, it wasn't until i quit my job at the library recently and began bringing water consistently that i learned it makes your acting a lot better mm. it, it's like uh like oil for for your mouth because voice acting on a on a dry mouth you'll trip over words and you don't even realize it mm-hmm. right um so it definitely helps tremendously so anyone listening to this who wants to get into voice acting bring your fucking water okay <laughs> they tell you that for a reason um but um yeah i auditioned for these studios and a couple of them uh, really liked me uh, one of them I auditioned for, but then they, I didn't really hear from them until a, a half a year later. And that's just that's just the nature of the biz, right? Um, but the ones that do pick you, show up to them consistently um, and just say yes. You know, do as much as you can. Don't be picky. You know, uh, one, one trap that a lot of actors fall into is that uh, they'll get the roles that I was getting when I first started, which is person in the crowd here random person in one scene for one second here right is that fun i mean that's subjective for me i was actually just really happy to just be there in the booth just recording even if it was for these little bit roles and i feel like the thing that really has helped my career is saying yes to these things and showing a willingness to be humble and open-minded and learn you know um a lot of actors go in there thinking that they're top dog, uh, and that can make them difficult to work with, but also you stagnate, <clears throat> not just as an actor, but in life. If you don't open yourself to the possibility that you, you're, you might be good, you could be better, and looking back on my first few voice recordings, especially in some of the first major roles I got, I think, fuck, I could have done that a lot better. And that's okay. You know, it just, everything takes time. Going back to boxing, you don't hit the bag, you know, immediately knowing how to keep your hands up or throwing a a straight jab or anything like that. That all takes time. I still don't know, you know, sometimes when I take these boxing classes and and my uh, trainer, Nick, he still has to remind me, keep your hands up. And then he'll remind me if I just go like that on my head. Um, And that, and... That was my start with voice acting. You know, 2020, Adam recommended it to me. I just went in there doing the best I could. And ever since then, I just was consistent. The, be- the best advice Adam gave me was be consistent and don't be an asshole. And that goes a really long way. You know, a lot of times when I record with people, they'll tell me, man, you're really easy to work with. You listen. And that, that matters a lot more than you thinking that you're the next fucking I don't know, uh, Jim Cummings or uh, whoever, or Kevin Michael Richardson. I'm just naming some of my favorite voice actors off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. be humble and, and be consistent mm. has really helped me. Um, my goal is to do voice acting full time, mm. um, but it's definitely a very competitive field. And uh, I've definitely been getting a lot more work since I quit the library. Making yourself available is a big thing, but. Um, I'm willing to just be patient, you know, and just keep knocking on doors. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great. And, and just keep honing my craft, yeah. Can you tell us about some of the roles you've done? And do you do just one voice or do you do multiple <laughs> characters? Like, I'm kind of curious about that. So here's the thing about voice acting, right? When you do roles, you have to sign a contract, the NDA, you can't disclose. Gotcha. <clears throat> you can't disclose. Uh, Can you speak generally? Like, not specific, but like. Yeah. See, the thing is, I would like to tell you what characters I do. You don't, you don't necessarily know when the thing you voice acted for comes out. So what I do is I do dub voiceover, which means I, I provide the English voice for programs that were originally recorded in Brazil or, or Spain, France, whatever. You know, you, you do the English dub over. And you, is it like uh, humans or is it cartoon? So more often than not, it's for humans, right? Um, sometimes you might get a cartoon. Uh, I always love the cartoons because with the cartoons you get to be a little more loose, right? But with humans, because it's real people, you have to be a little more subtle. 
in your voice acting. Um, but basically, you're in a booth, you're watching the original on one screen, on the other screen you have the lines, they tell you the time stamp that the line comes in, and your, do and your job as a, a dub over a voice actor is to not just fit your line in the span that they're saying theirs, but, you know, kind of match the intention or the read, as they say. So do you watch it, say, in Portuguese first to kind of get a vibe for the character? Or? Yeah, to get a, a vibe for, for the timing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you watch the... Sometimes you watch the original, and then you go for yours. Right. But eventually, you do get skilled enough to be able to predict the emotion and the timing right. um, just based on how many films you've done, you know there's a certain pattern in human emotion that you can just kind of learn to predict. And then sometimes you'll still get tripped up. Um, but that, that's generally what I, what I do. Um, as far as characters that I've done, I, I mean, I've done, I have done a couple of animes. Uh, I don't know if I can, my favorite role is a character that I don't think the, the show has come out yet. But when the, when they told me I was this character for this show, it's one of those animes that, maybe isn't huge in the US, but every mofo and their mother in Latin America knows it, right? Um, it's, a, it's a very old uh, manga that got an anime adaptation recently. And one of my favorite archetypes in fiction is kind of like the arrogant jackass with a heart of gold that, you know, he acts kind of cocky, but you know, he's just kind of doing it to amuse people. Uh, because I see a lot of myself in that. Um, and when they gave me this kind of character for this show, and he was a main character, I was fucking over the moon, man. And then I finally got to do uh, a kind of silly voice for the character. Um, I was laughing the whole time playing the character because he's such, he's such an arrogant pretty boy who thinks that, that he is the greatest gift to mankind that that he's literally a, a milk drop from god's tit um and then he does get humbled and then he kind of goes through a growth arc and then he still thinks that he's the greatest thing in the world you know he's just a little more uh grounded um that i would say is definitely my favorite character that i've played and i'm, I'm looking forward to when that uh comes out i've also played uh i was kind of typecast as a fatherly figure in a bunch of movies for a while when i first started acting they thought oh this guy has a deep gravelly voice give him all the dad roles <laughs> um and then eventually they were willing to let me play more villain roles nice. and for that i think it's because i kind of tap them on the shoulder and i go hey look i'm okay with all the daddy roles for many reasons but um give me a villain this character on the screen I can do this character. Let me do it. Please let me do it. Um, sometimes you just got to do that, man. And then they'll take the chance and say, okay, you're going to be this villain because I love playing mean motherfuckers, man. <laughs> you know, I, I'm always trying to be so nice to people in real life that the chance to just be a complete vile piece of shit is something I relish, right? So I, I've done a couple of big bombastic deep voice villains as well, which is super great. Uh, I think one of my favorite villains was in this, um, again, I, I, I'm trying to kind of dance around giving away too much details, sure, but sure. Um, it was a show about uh, mythological characters, mm. right? And I, I didn't play the villain in that, play, but I played one of his uh, main henchmen. So I got to do a scratchy voice like this? Oh yes, master! <laughs> you know, uh, so I, I love it when I get to just kind of do something besides my regular voice, and then the people in the engineering booth go, you can do that? And I go, yeah, motherfucker, I can do that. You just ain't giving me the chance yet, you know? So that opens up all sorts of... Yeah, absolutely. That's cool, man. Um, voice acting is very much a thing where you just kind of stumble around in the dark and it's just as much of a learning process for you as it is the guy in, the, in the engineering mm -hmm. booth. But I would say, man, more importantly, you know, a lot of times people think just because you can do a good impression of a character means you would be a good voice actor. The The real question is, and this is such a basic piece of advice, can you do that voice sad, angry, excited? Mm -hmm. Can you do that character just waking up and reading the ingredients on a cereal box, right? You have to consider, because at the end of the day, it's still, it's still acting, 
you know so that is uh, that's definitely a, a big important thing but uh, yeah I would say that those have been my main character roles like sort of paternal figures or, or villain roles sometimes I get uh, really goofy characters um, sometimes I get the, the big mighty warrior characters uh, what, what else have I gotten uh, sometimes I get <laughs> so some, usually usually in stuff from, from Spain and stuff like that I'll get cast as the, uh, the Casanova <laughs> nice. type character too which is really fun um, so th those have been some of the roles that I've gotten that over, over fun, the though. years. Yeah, yeah. Really cool. Um, it wasn't. It was literally not until this year, uh, around New Year's. It, it was New Year's. We were taking a break from the library, and for years I had this book sitting on my shelf collecting dust called um, the Complete Animation Handbook or something like that by the director of animation for Who Framed Roger Rabbit, uh, Richard Williams. I had that book sitting there for fucking years just to say, yeah, I, I'm an animator, but I didn't, I never opened it. And then around that time during the break, I had an iPad and I opened Procreate and I just began messing around with some of the animation lessons. And then I would hit play and then I would see the shit in motion. I go, oh boy, oh baby, right? Um, you really feel like Dr. Frankenstein seeing an animation come to life. Like when you see a bunch of drawings that you put together over the course of an hour or two hours, you're like, oh my God, this is getting annoying and tedious because it can get tedious just drawing like a person like this, and then like this, and then like this, right? But then you hit play and then you see it walking and then it, it's this incredible high. You know, I know it sounds absurd, but I, I imagine that the first time an animator makes their first animation they feel like Jesus killer dopamine hit yeah yeah it's a killer dopamine hit and then I just kept going through the book and just animating more and then that's when I said I don't want to do a disservice to my past self anymore and I'm just gonna study animation right not 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 even because I want to make money doing it but I just want to do it because it's something that I want to do my whole life and I just want to find out if it's something I'm really passionate about or just something that's just going to be like collecting baseball cards um you know it, it was like kind of one of those make or break type things and uh the really cool thing is that i found out that it, it's it's definitely still a passion you know uh it's one of those things that i'm just happy doing and uh when i started my semester at wolfson this year my first uh, class for animation my animation degree was storyboarding um, I was afraid that, that I would be dry of ideas, right? I was in this room filled with young 21, 22 year olds just out of high school. Um, and I was the only 32 year old motherfucker there, right? And we had to come up with an idea where we had to come up with uh, um, a folk tale, but placed in the modern day. And you know, the, the self doubt is real, right? You're thinking, can I come up with something? And then I did come up with an idea based on the old folktale Taley Poe about an old man who goes hunting and he kills a, uh, a weird creature. He eats the tail, the, tr the creature comes back for his tail and then he kills the old man, right? Except I said it in Miami and the old man is this big burly Cuban guy and the creature is a gator, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the idea became something so stupid and absurd and almost like a love letter to the weird wackiness of Miami and is it complete? Did you finish that thing? I finished the storyboard. I and uh, the professor and a bunch of the other students said, "You should see this through to be a fully animated thing." And I, I think what I'm really happy about is that this was the year where I finally decided to have faith in my passions and my ability to execute those passions. You know, a lot of I spent a lot of time just not doing things out of fear and, and self-doubt mm -hmm. and then what I wish I could have told my younger self is dude just do it just fucking do it you're gonna it's gonna be okay cut the self-doubt out and you're gonna see that everything is gonna be fine I think a part of me also didn't want to sacrifice free time right like just sitting around doing nothing and then you find that when you when your free time gets gobbled up working, but that work is something that you're actually passionate about, 
like voice acting or, or drawing, you feel fulfilled. Mm -hmm. You're okay sacrificing that time you used to spend just playing games or watching things on Netflix. And that's the thing about animation, man. St the storyboarding this thing took up all my free time. And I, I, I only had maybe one day a week to, to dedicate to uh, spending with my partner, man. But, but every other moment I was just drawing and drawing and drawing because I was so invested in it and I wanted it to be fucking great. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the most fulfilling thing and I'm just really happy that I finally embraced the butterfly of animation. You Very know, cool. yeah, yeah. When so, you have a product, you see the result, you have something concrete, you, you know, it's, it's rewarding, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And there, there's just so much to be said about just fearlessly diving into something that you really love. Because if you really love that thing, um, you know, more often than not, the, the skills and all that just comes on its own over time. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you really dedicate yourself to it. And it was something that um, I was just locked into, man. I was just fully ready to, to give my body, going back to that metaphor, uh, to animate him. And I would say that that's kind of been my main uh, focus over poetry lately. I would, I would say this year I, I kind of shifted from performing um, any, you know, anytime someone asks me to perform poetry, I'll be like, yeah, I'll, I'll come on over. But I would say that my passion, the flame kind of shifted from, from at least writing poetry to animating and voice acting, huh. you know, and, and I'm absolutely okay with that. That's very cool. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Dang, man. Some serious progression going on from yeah, yeah. just a few months. Like I haven't seen you, you know, really done a lot <laughs> yeah and me quitting my job it, it, it was a bunch of very fortunate events happening at the same time because uh, a friend that I knew from the improv days who primarily works as a DJ he wanted to grow his DJ company um, and he said hey man you're the first person I thought of because I know you used to study DJing in Costa Rica do you want to do this with me and I said sure he goes okay but we're gonna be getting so many gigs that you're gonna to have to quit your job. Is that something you're willing to do? I was scared shitless, man, because my whole life I was used to working nine to fives and knowing I had a paycheck coming in. But at the same time, I wanted to quit my job because the DJ stuff is mostly on weekends and that meant that I could finally voice act during the week without having to beg my boss to let me go. Mm -hmm. um, I was shitting my pants and then I finally did it. And man, it, it's just, I, I'm really wary of corny shit like manifesting and alignment and all this hippie shit that people say on Instagram all the time. But brother, when, when you do something because you want to take that leap of faith on yourself, one of my best friends put it best, you have to make the gamble on yourself because if you don't gamble on yourself, who else will? Maybe other people will take chances on you, but that doesn't matter if you don't have enough faith in your own abilities to make something happen that you're not willing to roll the dice on yourself. Um, and, and those are supremely wise words. So I, I rolled the dice and it's been really paying off, man. You know, the, I, I'm consistently DJing. The guy who hired me to, to DJ is always working to find more gigs. I'm getting better as a DJ as well. Um, getting more voice acting. I dedicated more time to my studies. So making that leap from leaving that nine to five job that I, that, that nine to five life that wasn't really fulfilling me, right. it just paid off in, in dividends. And, and I'm, again, I, I don't want to criticize people that are okay with that. Everyone has their own niche in life. And I think we all need people that are okay with that nine to five. But I think if you're not happy with it and you know that you want to be doing something else that you're good at and fulfills you, there's no shame in pursuing that, you know, uh, that that's, that's what I would say. And I would say, man, this year, 2023, it's just been all about me letting go of certain things that I would do because I didn't think I was good enough for my passions. So this year has just been all about uh, making those leaps of faith towards, towards myself, towards my passions. And uh, it's been a fun ride. Man, so happy for you. Congratulations, Paul, man. It's thank you, amazing, man. Thank man. you. I appreciate that. Man, that's really cool. So, 
Uh, this is a newer piece that I wrote for um, a, a horror poetry anthology book published by Indie Earth Publishing. And again, any of you folks that are interested in poetry should definitely follow that account. A bunch of really cool stable of poets. Um, you know, uh, Charles McCaskill, uh, Liz Knightley, um, man, a bunch of, of other na DSB poetry, uh, just a bunch of poets that, that escape me right now, but it, it's a really cool stable of poets, myself included. So I, I, I wanted to be part of this anthology of poetry because I love horror, but I was super busy with my studies and I literally did not send this poem until the day before it, the, the deadline, right? And it's funny how that happened because I just sat down and I just, what the fuck am I gonna write? And then this all, it, it's almost like everything that was my, uh, I was going to therapy for a while. I kind of slowed down on that. Um, Cause I'm, I'm doing well, I'm, folks, keep going to therapy even if you're doing well, okay? It's, it's like saying, just because I'm healthy, I'm gonna start eating fucking whoppers every day. Don't do that. But therapy definitely does help and it helps to keep going semi-consistently just to discuss things, you know. I would say that that also helped me a lot this year, man. I, I was going through a tough time, especially earlier uh, this year and, and, and she really helped me. What I love about my therapist is that anytime I would say something that was a load of bullshit she would shake her head and go oh, yeah. she would go that's bullshit <laughs> <laughs> she goes i'm here to call you on your own bullshit so i want you to think about what you just said and and that really helped me learn to keep it real with myself and she pointed out that this poem kind of seemed like me just kind of spewing a bunch of little demons that were swimming around in my head so a little context about this poem um, the name of this poem is I Was a Middle-Aged Trypanosome. A trypanosome is a type of parasite. Um, my favorite kind of horror is body horror. Things like The Fly by David Cronenberg, The Thing by John Carpenter. Um, you know, some people like slashers, some people like psychological horror. I really like horror where people just get mutilated and transformed into grotesque creatures. They lose their limbs, they turn into some horrible nondescript blob with all these gooey noises or they get taken over from the inside by some creature i love that shit and i don't know why um it was to the point where i would when i was working at the library i would just check out books to read about different diseases and parasites that would infect people and i would read them from start to finish and I would, I would show them to my friends like look man this is so cool look at this giant tapeworm that people used to, used to get in their legs and they would look at me like what the fuck is wrong with you um anyway so th this poem was kind of inspired by that i was a middle-aged trypanosome well i cracked my eyes open this morning and felt the old usual way like a sideshow freak naked on stage and tombed in the wrong play i tried heaving myself out of bed and scrambled to my daily conveyor belt charade but my hands and feet didn't feel like my own my brain was burning like a fever dream parade. So I stumbled over to my grimy bathroom mirror and trembled in disbelief at the reflection in the grime. My eyes were pulsating kaleidoscope stalks. And my flesh was oozing a putrid slime. I bolted out screams choking in my throat and was drowning in a miasma of confusion and hate. But I couldn't deal with this shit right now. Surely my boss will smoke me if I'm late. I grabbed my phone and my hand trembled in fear of calling my boss and hearing him inevitably pissed. But my hand peeled off my arm like rotten bark and revealed writhing tapeworms from my bloodied wrist. I saw a text from the big man pop up saying, don't bother coming in anymore. Jesus Christ, somebody come love me, please. I'm turning into God's little insect parasite whore. I ran to my baby's house just a few blocks away and tried to beg her to tell me everything's all right. But she ran screaming and tried bashing my brains with a baseball bat and cried, there's a maggot eating your tongue, fat, writhing, and white. I bolted out her door as she called the cops in a loathsome frenzy left me quaking in an aisle of fear as I crawled down my little Havana neighborhood as everyone jeered or shouted in Cuban Spanish at the grotesque sight so queer. 
I don't know what I did to deserve turning into this, a filthy 32-year old trypanosome. I just tried surviving my daily gauntlet and making ends meet so I could at least keep my tiny efficiency that I call home. My stalks grew bigger, the tapeworms thicker. My mouth put a puppet for a fat vermin full of spite. And I felt a queer pain between my legs and saw a viciously huge sack of writhing mutant parasites. I lay on the burning pavement wishing I could just run home, but my flesh and limbs were shredding off my bones. The Kayocha crowd gawked and recorded me on their phones, and in my long, mediocre life, I swear to you I never felt more alone. I turned my belly up to the sky, the squirming stalks unable to cry, and tried to come to terms with all my hopes that never came to be. But before I could accept my wretched insectoid state of being, a hungry bird's maw drove straight down a perfect new home for a trypanosome like me. That's it. That's amazing. <laughs> I'll do this one. Um, people always seem to like it. Um, so I wrote this one because a lot of times, a lot of poets that I know, they'll write poetry about Miami and it's all this really saccharine horseshit about the diversity and the palm trees and the, the girls in their bikinis and all that. And I just feel like there, there's not a lot of love poetry that's critical of this city, man, because it, it, Miami is a city that you love, but it's a city that makes it difficult to love it because there's just so much. It's a hard city to live in, man. You know, I grew up here um, and I'm I'm always told that that's such a rarity, you know, for someone to be born and raised here in Miami because a lot of folks come from other places, right? And want to stay. <laughs> and want and want to stay. Yeah, yeah. But I was born and raised here in the 305 and I've seen so many changes. I missed out on a lot when I moved to Costa Rica when I was 19. I lived there until I was 26, dude. Um, so it, it was kind of like that cartoon Samurai Jack where he gets transported to the future. Uh, and then when he goes back to his past, he's just like, what the fuck happened? That's what it felt like coming back to Miami. Winwood, <clears throat> when I was growing up in the 90s, was this warehouse, scary-ass district. I come back and it's transformed into Party Central. Um, and just... It, it just feels like it's become more expensive to live in gradually over over time as well. Even in the time that I've moved back here in 2017, it's just really changed every year. Every year. Every year. Um, For sure. And there's a, a lot of beautiful stuff about this city, but I feel like it's a city that has its head so far up its own ass, <laughs> drunk on its delusions about what it is, about the image that it tries to project that I wish Miami had a little more authenticity and didn't believe in its own um, image of itself so much. And people begin overpopulating this city because, because of that image that it projects. And I really wish Miami was a city for the people again, man. Um, I don't even know what that means, honestly, but that's just what I really feel no, I uh, about this city. Yeah. Uh, so th this is a, 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 a poem I wrote about that called Damn That Dream. Mm -hmm. I used to have it memorized, but it, it's been a while, so I don't want to risk stumbling over stuff. Damn that dream. I rattle my fists to whatever, whoever sits in their cloudy golden throne in the sky like a cosmic puppeteer. Damn that dream, and damn you. It's a dream that festers in my rib cage like fat writhing maggots that never get their fill. A dream whose lingering longing poison kiss stings harder when I walk down the cold concrete veins of the downtown graveyard. Alleyways lined with sunken withered faces trembling in their cardboard kingdoms and the wretched waste of whatever isn't deemed magical enough for this magic city. A dream that aches dull and persistent like a gaping wound that never heals. A well-worn shard in my heart that I've learned to live with so well. I drag slow and lonely footsteps down this wicked neon oasis. This brickle Babylon, this windward wasteland creeping deep in the heat looking for some leftover debris of truth. Whatever the hell that even means now. It's a familiar dream in which I reach my hand out like a curious newborn and I kiss the moon slow, deep, and hard. 
We moan and we howl and dance and she splits my skull with satellite love. A rhythm comes oozing out of my head that makes Satan cry and God want to tell lies. I spy a honey dripping thigh. Una ventanita and I'm chasing the colada high. I take a sip. I look up and sigh and cast a weary gaze down Flagler Street and its endless symphony of strife. Everyone living and dying for their own palaces of the mind. That's the dream you don't wake up from. The one where you're up at the top of the mountain and all eyes are on you. So there ain't nothing left for us to do except to wake up and savor what's left in your cup. Sip by sip by sip. Did tell us about your memorable fight you had. A memorable fight. So, yeah, like I was, I was saying when the, the mic is off that you know, everything to me ties to boxing, man. What what we first met up here for, and um, everything requires a willingness to humble yourself and, and be willing to learn. Um, you know, when I started voice acting, I was amongst a bunch of people that were well seasoned actors. All I had under my belt was some improv classes and uh, some cold script readings, but I was just willing to do the work. And um, and it even comes down to boxing, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, I'm definitely never going to be, you know, championship material. But if I chose to go that route and really dedicate myself to boxing, I'm, I'm sure I could have done something, you know, because I love the sport. I love hitting things. <laughs> but boxing is really therapeutic, too, man. It's people who say, oh, I don't like to work out. That's overrated. Let me eat my burgers. It's not just about looking good. It's about feeling good. Mm -hmm. In, in the brain as well um, and I think a lot about how in Costa Rica when I used to spar people sometimes I would get rocked and I remember one time I was out for like a month and a half because I got hit so hard that uh, I had a um, it's like an internal bruise in your chest area where you can't breathe heavy that's how hard I got hit one day this dude fucking decked me so hard in the rib that I could not take deep breaths for about a month it if I, broken rib maybe or i don't know if it was a broken rib but it, um i think it was just an internal bruise yeah. right and boxing is such a brutal sport man people think oh you can go in there and get rocked a few times when you really feel that pain that's a whole world that a lot of people are very fortunate to not know <laughs> and sometimes I, I i think i'm so masochistic that i just want to get a little taste just just a little taste of that world to know what's on the other side of these fighters, right? Um, but one fight that I'll never forget, in Costa Rica, the boxing atmosphere was very different. Um, it was 2010, I used to go to boxing at El Parqueo Nacional, and the gym was run by this guy who was like a Latino Clint Eastwood, right? Very sh sh uh, short-spoken guy, um, but you would just go, you would pay a certain amount of month to train at the gym. Uh, it was a very, grassroots gym right which i thought was super cool costa rica man it was it was it's changed a lot in recent years it's become very uh there's a lot more concrete is all i can say it's kind of starting to look like florida right? yeah like man South florida. yeah yeah but even when i first moved there in 2009 there like where i used to live it was just a little village Almost. That was where my dad grew up. There was a lot of forest around there. It was a little. What town were you in? San Isidro, uh -huh. de Heredia. Yeah. yeah. And in beautiful just, cathedral there. Yeah, beautiful cathedral. And dude, in just a few years that I was living there, they tore down all the trees. They built a fucking neighborhood there, and I'm just like, I don't want Costa Rica to start becoming one of these places that loses its beauty for development. Mm. Please, for the love of God, no. Like I know my dad would be rolling in his grave if Costa Rica became that. And I visited a couple of years ago and it looks a lot more, I don't know if the word is civilized, industrialized, I don't know. But when I was living there in my early 20s, it was still very much grassroots. I used to go to this gym in San Jose. Uh, you'd pay a certain amount a month to get to go box. And the thing is that the guy who runs the gym, he would just give you some gloves, headgear, a mouthpiece, get in there. And I'm like, really? And he's like, yeah. I was scared shitless, dude. And the thing is that in my 20s, you know, your hormones are still going. So I had a difficult time kind of uh, controlling the fear. And the second time that I fought, 
I went up against this guy who was my height, you know, really, you know, kind of kind of pretty boy looking dude. He would go there with his own personal trainer. He was throwing all these fast combos. Um, and uh, I was getting rocked, man. Like, that's the thing, man. Like, I was just learning to box, and I, I'm not going to mince words. I would get my shit slapped five ways to Sunday. And then the guy who would run the gym gave me the one of the best... <laughs> stupidest pieces of advice that I ever got uh, after the first round and he saw that I was just getting gassed out he goes ven, ven aquí te voy a decir algo pégale duro 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 pero no te pones bravo and I'm just looking at him like what the fuck does that mean he, he, what that means for you non-Spanish speakers is hit him really 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 hard but don't get mad <laughs> because he saw that I would, I would any anytime I would get hit, I would get mad, yeah. right? And then I would just not hit anything because this dude was just... Well, it was all motion. Yeah, it was all motion, right? Being mad gets you nothing in the ring. You, you, you lose your focus. I yeah, guess. you, lo you yeah. lose your focus. Um, and but, but he also saw that I was mad, but I was also afraid of hitting the other okay. guy because I didn't want to hurt him. What? Yeah, yeah. You do need a bit of a, a killer instinct <laughs> to be good at the sport. When you fight someone, man, some guys, they, they're just waiting to hurt the other guy. Right, right, right. I wasn't, right? Because I, I, I was always like, you know, this kind of sweet, slight, slightly antisocial weird guy. And it was new to you. Was... And it was new to me. And the idea of actually hurting someone was scary as fuck to me. And then he tells me that. And then the bell rings. And then I just go into the, the ring uh, and I, I was looking at the other guy like, like I was pissed, but I didn't feel mad, right? Like I was doing my best to really control my emotions. He would hit me in the face, but I was doing that thing where I was just kind of stalking him down to the corner and he'd keep trying to cut me off and I was just kind of walking him down. I finally got him down to the corner and then it was just one, two, one, two, one, two, and then he would hit me in the face and then it's just this thing where you reach a state of mind where nothing hurts you and I just kept going, <laughs> in the fucking corner and I saw a little blood coming and I'm just hitting him even harder and it got to the point where the, the trainer came in and was like, hey, 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 calm down, calm, calm down, calm down. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We went a few more rounds where it was a little more evenly paced but I'm never going to forget the way that the day after that, the guy who I fought was there um, and he comes up to me and he goes, hey, do you want to run laps around the gym? I, I said, sure. We're running around the, the gym Um and he goes, dude, have you been boxing for a long time? I go, no, not really. Why? He goes, because, man, in that second round, you were looking at me like you didn't want to just fight. You looked like you wanted to kill me and my family. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, I'm just, I'm just learning just like you, man. And he goes, yeah, but that, that was really something else, man. I was like, I was hitting you, and it just made you hit me even harder. Right, right, right. And um, I just think about, you know, what could have happened if I really – went full steam into the boxing world but you know that that's in in life you gotta pick and choose what what you dedicate yourself to and and maybe maybe if reincarnation is a real thing maybe i'll come into the next life as a fighter but for now it, it's just something that i try to balance with all my other artistic passions very cool man yeah, yeah. i love that <laughs> very cool